All right. So we're back together on the screen yes. because I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our next featured speaker. Um, I'll start with the stuff that's on your bio. Actually, I'll only say the stuff that's on your bio. Um, so Dr. Derek Cabrera is an internationally known system scientist who was inducted in 2021 as a member, as a member of the International uh, Systems uh, Academy for Systems and Cybernetic Science for outstanding contributions to the field. Nice job. Um, he currently serves on faculty at Cornell University. He is the director of the graduate certification program in systems thinking, modeling, and leadership, who you will be hearing from our students uh, later. He's senior scientist here at Cabrera Research Lab, serves on the West Point uh, Systems Engineering Advisory Board. He's given two TED Talks. He holds some patents. He's written, produced a rap song. He's climbed some of the highest mountains in the world. He's written lots of books. Blah blah blah. Big yeah, deal. that's good. That's... Anyway, my favorite systems thinker and our next speaker, Dr. Derek Cabrera. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I have to share my slides. This is quite the transition. Okay, so um, let's move this chair. Very excited to be here, uh, and and. Thank you all for uh, for coming. I hope to share uh, with you a bit of what our lab studies and what we teach at Cornell, which is systems thinking uh, in the policy school, the Brooks Policy School. And I hope by the end of this half hour, you'll agree with um, my, my basic premise, which I'll share with you at the front end and then build up to it as a conclusion, which is that we now have a, 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 an empirical, a much better empirical understanding of what systems thinking is, and we can define it um, somewhat as an emergent property and look at its simple rules. Um, and awareness of these simple rules constitute a skill that can be taught and can be learned uh, by people, but it must be practiced uh, through what we sometimes call cognitive moves. Um, the old adage that neurons that fire together wire together is, is quite accurate. Uh, and I'd like to coin a, a sort of a new phrase, which is neurons that move together, groove together, because it relates to the very essence of the problem, which is that systems thinking is really an emergent property, more like getting into the groove uh, of, of, say, music or something than practicing a bunch of, of specific dance moves. But the way that you, we get to enjoy that that groove is through through the practice of moves. But that's sort of the final conclusion of my talk. Um, so, but I, I want to share with you um, a little bit more how we get there. Our lab uh, studies uh, fast and adaptive thinking in complex adaptive environments, which amounts to studying in scientific terms, cognitive uh, or complexity, um, or in popular terms, systems thinking and systems. So in the next half hour, I'll be sharing with you the ideas from our research that cover two semesters, uh, uh, graduate courses at Cornell. Um, and uh, so maybe first I'll start with a, a story. When uh, when Laura and I, who at the time was my esteemed colleague, but is now my beautiful wife, uh, when we first met, it was on a National Science Foundation grant. And the goal of the grant was to take a somewhat technical uh, theory that I developed to call the DSRP and, and elucidate it um, and translate it to make it sort of more wildly, more widely uh, accessible. Um, so Laura was on the grant for translational purposes and I was on the grant for theory purposes. And um, I remember uh, early on in the grant that we were sitting at actually an airport uh, on the first day of our job together. And Laura said to me, so give me a, you know, a brief explanation of the sort of theory. And I did and jotted down a few things on a scrap of paper on the back of the, actually the ticket itinerary. And uh, when I was finished, she said, so I said, do you know what we should do? Because I'm not entirely clear on what, what the next steps are. And she paused and then she said, I do. And I was a little surprised by that. And I said, you know, well, okay, what is it? What should we do? And she said, we need to go teach it to kindergartners. 
Um, and so for the next 10 years, a very large part of our research agenda, aside from the, the, the basic research, was to look at the translational research and teach it to kindergartners, first graders, third graders. Um, we taught it to sixth graders, 11th graders, undergraduates, and even, even uh, eventually executives. And since then, we teach these ideas to C-suite uh, executives in the Silicon Valley's most innovative companies, to scientists, to businesses, NGOs, government organizations, even special forces and professional athletes and, and hundreds of um, K-12 districts. And do you know what the, the thing that, that kind of still to this day blows my mind a little bit uh, is, is that even though these different types of people are so different and they're focused on such different things, I mean, a, a kindergartner and a CEO or a scientist, very different. Um, we teach them the same simple uh, underlying rules, and uh, and and yet they are applicable. And you're going to see later today talks about this, uh, in, in particular, Dr. Christian Sprague, Sprague Scott, on on the, how simple things can be applied to very very complex situations. Um, so we teach kindergartners the same thing we teach scientists and executives. And you know, you should also know that I haven't always been a, a systems theorist uh, or a cognitive scientist. In fact, I, I came to academia in a very meandering, sort of Forrest Gumpian sort of way. I started out uh, as a high school dropout and then spent nearly two decades as a mountain guide, uh, 200 or so days a year in a tent, taking clients up the mountains of the world. And this is where I, I got the bulk of my training in systems long before I knew that there was a thing called system science or even systems thinking. Um, and I've had many great mentors and alma maters, uh, alma maters uh, but by far my most influential mentor and my most beloved alma mater has been nature. Um, the mountains, the, the real world, uh, that has been the most influential. It was in the mountains, actually, that I came to understand systems and the importance of systems thinking, even though I didn't know at the time that it was called that. Because to a climber, the summit of a mountain is just an interdisciplinary problem to solve, right? But to solve this problem, you have to understand the mountain and the expedition as a complex system of systems, an integrated whole. And there are many different types of levels of, of systems. There's the systems of physics and technical systems like your, your technical gear and your rope rescue systems, your uh, technology, and the external systems like the, the forces like weather and your snowpack and the geology and geography. Um, there's the systems of biology and chemistry, your physiology, hydration, energy, metabolism. Especially, there's the transfer of heat and moisture, with the mismanagement of which can lead you to anything from mundane types of uh, things like headaches or dehydration or sleep deprivation to more severe things like hyper or hypothermia or frostbite or even high altitude pulmonary or cerebral edema. So climbing is ultimately not only a physical game. It's also a mental game. So you have these uh, psychological systems that you have to understand, but it's also a sociological game, right? A, a, a collective social game. Many people don't realize this, but most expeditions fail not because of a technical challenge on the mountain or as a result of the weather, but because people in the expedition can't get along. They fail due to interpersonal dynamics. And what I would propose to you is that this is not so different from the situation that any of us find ourselves in. Um, where we need to see our world as a system of interconnected systems. But if I were to boil down all that I learned from nature about systems thinking for 20 some odd years in the mountains and, and in nature, I'd boil it down to this one life lesson. And that is, we have to learn to love reality. And I mean, really fall in love with reality, seek it out, care about getting it right, Seek the truth, even when it hurts and makes you mad or sad, or even when it makes you feel things you don't want to feel. And that means paying particular attention 
to the signs around you, but also means paying particular attention to the bias that's inside of you, to be aware of what you desperately want to be true. No one wants to be lost on the side of a mountain. Everything in you, when that happens, wants to at least kind of pretend that everything's okay. But remaining calm and embracing the truth of your situation is usually the best remedy. And in fact, we, we mountaineers have a, a saying, which is that the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. So love reality. The reason I boil it down to this basic idea is that I can teach you how to analyze and understand systems, but it's far more difficult to teach someone to want to get it right, to keep striving to get it right to love reality, to care so much that you actually want to hear from it and not be in denial to it. That's the hardest part. The rest is just practice. The best part, though, I will tell you, is that uh, reality is putting in the work. It's always communicating with you. It's always telling you about itself. If you're listening, not just listening with your ears, but with your whole person, your whole body, your whole human apparatus. And in fact, this is one of the things we focus on most with our graduate students is getting them to listen to the system before they start solving problems. Because problem solving is often our first bias. Our students come to graduate school passionate about problems, challenges, and crises. And they're quite sure that what the problem is, and they're often quite sure of the solution. But we spend a good deal of time to get them to stop solving problems and start understanding systems. Understanding systems is loving reality. And the nice thing about systems or reality is that if you don't listen, if you don't hear what they're telling you and you and learn the lessons that they're teaching, then reality will teach it again and again. Reality is a full-time, persistent, and stalwart teacher. So this is kind of our world. It's a blue dot, aka reality. It's a system. It's a system made up of many systems, what I call a system of systems, SOS, that are interconnected, not merely a bunch of systems, which are BOS, right? We face many grand challenges and wicked problems as a society, not to mention the more mundane problems that we face every day as individuals. Mass killings, climate change, war, famine, hunger, problems in our jobs, in our marriages, in our family, with our children, with our friends and loved ones. And as Einstein said, we can't solve problems with the same thinking we use to create them. So let's look a little deeper into what that means. Our thinking is so important because it drives predictions, behavior, emotion, and decisions. Whether you're aware of it or not, behind every prediction, behavior, emotion, and decision is a mental model or a schema. So I wanted you to take this in like a fine wine, to see it, see it, swirl it, sniff it, sip it, savor it. Let it sit on your, on your cognitive tongue. When what you think aligns with the way things actually are, the decisions you make will work out as planned. And this is incredibly important to policy folks and things like that. But we can also take the inverse to this statement, which is that when things don't work out the way you planned, that's reality telling you your mental model was wrong. And I want you to think about this simple, but somewhat to me, sublime idea in terms of grand challenges that we face, the global and personal crises that we face, the wicked problems that we face, and even the everyday problems that we face. Because we often think of challenges, crises, problems as these things that need to be solved or situations that shouldn't be the way they are. But I want you to consider that challenges, crises, and wicked problems are actually something else entirely. They're feedback. Feedback from reality that your mental model of the system is wrong, that the way you or we are thinking about the system is wrong. So if we're to love reality, let's start off with some basic features. The real world, you could say, is volatile, uncertain, complex, or ambiguous, or adaptive. Um, and that 
really isn't the problem. The problem is that's that's just reality, right? The the problem is that our while the real world is what we call VUCA, the way we tend to think about this VUCA world is what I sometimes call lame linear, mechanistic, anthropocentric, meaning human-centered, and oftentimes overly ordered. The problem is the mismatch between how we think that these systems work and how these systems work. Our thinking is biased in ways that don't match up with the way the real world actually is. And we project this bias onto the system. Let me give you a, just a few examples just to kind of flesh this out a little bit, this idea. The real world is dynamic. It's adaptive, it's organic, and it's constantly evolving. Yet we tend to think in very mechanistic ways. We, we use uh, metaphors that indicate this, these kinds of ways, like the universe is like a clock or the brain is like a computer. But the universe is no more like a clock than the brain is like a computer. The brain is 90 billion neurons with more connections than there are atoms in the universe. It's encased in a three pound and folded mushy gelatin like mass and distributed throughout our experience grounding body. And in fact, people at the cutting edge of designing computers are trying to make them more like brains. The real world is multivalent by nature, meaning and both can be true. Yet our thinking tends to be needlessly bivalent, either or thinking. Um, you can have either or thinking inside of and both thinking. Uh, but but we, you know, the, the real world has these multi variables. So let me ask you a simple question. Take any product or service. Does a, does a customer want it to be faster or cheaper? And of course they want it to be both because the universe, reality, nature, systems are multivalent, not always bivalent, although there is bivalency inside the multivalency. But we continue to adopt the sort of tyranny of either or thinking rather than the embrace the genius of and both thinking. And our social systems are born of this uh, somewhat binary thinking from the ones and zeros of our technology to our retributive system of justice, guilty or not guilty, to our two-party political systems. The real world is networked and nested and complex with a sprinkling of randomness. Yet we think of things in ordered and static categories and hierarchies. And the real world is nonlinear and includes feedback and webs of causality. Yet we, we think in linear and causal ways, looking for a single or root causes. And we implement sort of silver bullet policies and solutions to problems that require webs of solutions that match the webs of causes. And you're gonna hear about this uh, later in the day around uh, the, the, the very difficult issue of mass killings and research that was done there. The real world is agnostic to human endeavors. We are small and insignificant, yet we tend to look at things through our human-centered, anthropocentric lens. Our world tends to center around us. So we need to think differently, to think more like nature does, more like reality does. This is the crux of falling in love with reality, a love affair that lies at the heart of science. And this is what we study, how to do this better, how to get better at it. So we all suffer from bias, cognitive bias. There are many thousands of biases, hundreds that are formally studied. I think 288 different biases at last count that we formally study. But the root bias that underlies all of them, I call reality bias. And it basically goes like this. We experience the world directly as it is. But the truth is that we experience the world through the veil of our mental models or our schema. The solution to reality bias is the simple awareness of and recognition of our mental models. Mental models are pervasive and ubiquitous. In other words, they're constant. So let's look at an example of what I mean when I say mental models. And this is just a, a video of some wildebeests. And they're looking at this thing and they have a mental model or a scheme of what, uh, what it is. Mm. 
So systems thinking requires that we acknowledge mental models exist. That's the first part. And that they are merely approximations of reality. Um, in fact, George Box, the statistician, said all models are wrong, but some are useful. Our mental models are just approximations. And because of this, we need to test our mental models in the real world, preferably as soon as is humanly possible. Um, and then we get feedback from the real world. Like I spoke of before, it's constantly giving feedback by just existing. And we adapt our mental model based on that information. That's the, this is called the systems thinking loop. It's the loop that's at the basis of human learning and even you know the basic idea of science. Um, and it's an iterative feedback loop. So we go around and around and hope that it gets incrementally better. We incorporate feedback from the real world to increase the alignment between our mental models and the real world. But reality bias has a, a partner in crime who's equally cunning and it's called confirmation bias. One of my favorite Farside cartoons perfectly illustrates confirmation bias. These two pilots are asking themselves, hey, what's that uh, mountain goat doing way up here in a cloud bank, right? And these pilots are not in love with reality. They're in love with their mental models. So reality is about to give them some feedback. Now, what I want to make very clear about this confirmation bias is note that while systems thinking fits the mental model to the real world based on feedback, evidence, and facts on the ground, confirmation bias is the mirror opposite. It fits the real world to our mental model, something that a fair amount of us do on a near constant basis. Now let's zoom into these mental models. These mental models we see are comprised of two parts. There's the information and there's the way that the information is organized, right? So the information is the data and then there's the organization or structuring of that data. So let me just give you a, a little bit of understanding of, of what we mean by this. Information is content or data. Um, it's, it's effectively meaningless until we organize it in some way. Organization can go by many names and does go by many names. Uh, thinking is what we use to organize information. The scientific term for thinking is cognition. We sometimes also code it, call it encoding or structuring information. and the combination of those two things, information that is organized, gives us meaning or mental models. And mental models are important because they drive the predictions we make, the decisions we make, the behaviors that we exhibit, and in, in many cases, the even the emotions that we have and things like that. So, so just an example to, to, to put this more and uh, make this easier to understand, um, we see two sentences here, the same exact information, but structured differently, and we get very, very different meaning. Woman without her man is helpless. Woman without her man is helpless. So same information, different structure, different meaning. And if we zoom in further to what mental models are, we see that they have patterns or simple rules that they follow. and those patterns we call DSRP, making distinctions, organizing systems of part whole, distinctions of identity other, recognizing action reaction relationships, and taking point of view perspectives. And this is in fact why we call it systems thinking. The name itself characterizes the bringing together of these real world systems and our mental models of those systems in a way that is VUCA and cast friendly. Now, Laura is going to talk uh, later uh, later today about the, the research studies um, behind this. Uh, th this talk is more kind of an introductory talk of, of the basic ideas and theory. Um, and uh, so tune in to Laura's talk later today. To we we'll go into more of the, the detailed research. But it's important to understand, and this is something that um, that confuses people a little bit, DSRP is something your brain is already and always doing. You're all, always making distinctions. You're always taking a, at least a perspective, your own. Um, you don't get to decide whether you, you're using DSRP any more than you get to choose whether you're affected by gravity. 
The question is not, will you use it? The question is, are you aware? It's, it's really just an awareness paradigm, which we call in cognition, metacognition, just thinking about your thinking or being aware of your thinking. And so we need to change or think differently about thinking itself. And I want to give you a few examples to make this point. Thinking is like a, a mixed martial arts fight, let's say. The fight itself is organic and dynamic and adaptive and somewhat disordered in, in, a, in a very VUCA way. Um, even when the fighters are the same, no two fights will play out exactly the same way. So how do you prepare for such an adaptive or moving target? Well, you, you practice. You practice the moves and string them together. You practice moves in Muay Thai or jujitsu or you know uh, boxing or wrestling, those kinds of things. You practice, 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 and then you play it out in the real world that is very emergent. The same, for example, is true of music. A jam session is organic, it's dynamic, it's adaptive and somewhat disordered. Um, no two jam sessions will play out the same way. So how do you prepare? Well, you build the muscle memory in your fingers by practicing the moves and chords and string them together. Doing things in complex environments can be very consequential and they still require practice. So the same is true, for example, for military operations. We prepare for the VUCA reality by practicing wargaming the moves and the maneuvers. And so I wanna make this kind of analogy between these ideas to thinking, because a lot of folks don't think of thinking this way. And a lot of the frameworks and theories that currently exist are stepwise processes rather than thinking of thinking as an emergent property of some simple set of rules, right? Thinking is no different. And we, and we now have indication of this empirically that, that, that these moves are required, that we have to practice these moves and burn the neurons or, or move and groove or whatever you wanna call it um, in order to perform in these real world scenarios, which are organic and dynamic and complex, right? So, Another way of saying this is what we call thinking is an emergent property, collective behavior. But this thinking is governed by underlying simple rules. And these simple rules operate at multiple levels of scale, whether it's interoception, perception, attention, what we're attending to, cognition, emotion, whether it's right and left hemispheric attention or perspectival, neuronal, or at the individual or even the social level. We are building social mental models as well, collectively. This is profoundly different from the stepwise frameworks that have been previously offered. At any given moment, your neurons, your brain, your mind are following simple interaction rules. But here's what I find so interesting. Being aware of these simple rules can lead your brain to attend to different things, to attend, to pay attention to different things to build different mental models or schema and make different decisions. And so in that sense, uh, I find this incredibly interesting that being aware of these simple rules leads to that difference in attention. And so there's a feedback between the collective behavior and the simple rules. Now I'll just uh, wrap up with, there are thousands of moves that come from these four patterns, distinction, um, system, relationship, and perspective, and dozens of extremely and immediately useful ones. An expert might be using a few dozen on a regular basis, but all are based on just these four underlying patterns and their elements. And um, Laura will talk later about how our research shows that that there's kind of a, a an 80-20 rule, which is that if you if you focus on these five it'll get you, you know, most of the way. Uh, so these five moves. So you don't have to think about thousands of moves. You can start with a few moves that will dramatically affect your ability towards complex cognition. Um, but we do find that when it comes to thinking, people have a hard time understanding the connection between simple cognitive moves and the complex, dynamic, organic outcome that we associate with actual thinking, right? 
So I'll just close with this. We have many challenges and you're going to hear about them today. Many problems, many crises, many what we call wicked problems. Those are the kinds of things that we study in a policy school. Um, we have many different of these challenges. And these problems are reality. Reality works in webs of causality and it requires webs of solutions. Wicked problems and grand challenges require a more systemic approach or systems thinking. Listen to the systems and hear what they're telling us. The problems and challenges we see are feedback that, are, that our mental models are wrong. And we have to align our thinking with the complexity of the world. We now have more empirical evidence about what systems thinking is uh, over the 70 or so formal years that we've been studying it. And importantly, we know how to teach it and what specifically to teach. Now, when Laura and I started our lab, we had a vision of 8 billion thinkers, a world full of systems thinkers. And the reason for that is that at that time, systems thinking was only available to specialists and experts. It was trapped sort of in, a, in an ivory tower and not particularly useful for everyday and wicked problems that we face. What our research has tried to do in the last 25 years is to make systems thinking more democratic to make it more accessible and practical, to literally put it into practice by everyone and anyone. Because the problems that we're facing are being generated by 8 billion people. So we need 8 billion thinkers to solve those problems. Um, so I hope you'll join us in our vision of, of doing this because we definitely can't do it alone. And with that, I'll, I'll wrap and... Uh, I guess Laura's going to do magic move Q and A. The moderator magic move for this first part. All right. So, um, great session. Thank you. What I would like to do is start with the first question I saw come in, which is something that you've said a couple of times that might seem a little bit backwards to the audience, where you're saying that the wicked problems we're seeing are actually feedback rather than outcomes, and people were wondering, could you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, if you, if you think about it, if if um, if we have, you're going to hear a lot today about research that's been done in mass killings, for example. If we have these mass killings here in the United States, it's a it's a significant problem. Well, that problem is reality giving us feedback that something we're doing, in fact, a lot of somethings we're doing, isn't working. That that our mental model of the way we approach things, the way we do things, the way we build things, the way we design things, and a lot of different things, not just one thing, uh, is, is wrong. So reality is giving us feedback that, hey, you know, like you, you think that this is the way to design a system or several systems within a system of systems. But the outcome of that type of design is, for example, mass killings. And so we should think about that as feedback. These challenges that we face, these crises that we face, these wicked problems that we face are feedback from reality, from real world systems that are telling us, hey, you know what? The way you're thinking about this, you, you, you don't have it right yet. So you need to think about it differently. And then the question is, well, how do I need to think about it differently? I need to think in more systemic ways. I can't solve something that is based on a web of causality with a single root cause, for example. That's a that's a thinking error, right? If, if there's a web of causality, there needs to be a web of solution. Does that help that, a little bit? Yes, that's great. Um, following up on that, one of the questions from the audience is, how do we deal with um, the impact of bias or self-imposed ceilings inside of our mental models when we're building? How do we reconcile that? Yeah, again, that comes to metacognition. The research on metacognition is pretty clear. Meta-analyses that are done across different empirical studies is pretty clear that increasing metacognition will increase um, success or effectiveness across many different domains. So personal, professional, you know, all the different domains. So just being aware of the distinctions that you're making, for example, and not, or not making, mm -hmm. being more aware of what the other, the I distinctions are identity other. So rather than just seeing what you see, see the things that you don't see, meaning you put a part of your metacognitive awareness on, these are the things I'm seeing, 
what are the things I'm not seeing? So even though you don't see them, so they don't exist, you're asking a metacognitive question that causes you to attend to them. And that attention is going to change your cognition. It's going to change automatically, dynamically, your perspective. And you're going to broaden the view of the point view perspective. So it really comes down to, to, to metacognition and having kind of structures that help you make metacognitive predictions. We call them structural predictions mm -hmm. that there will be structure here, right? If, if there's an identity I'm making, there, there by definition is an other. If there's parts, there by definition is a whole. If okay. there's an action, by definition, there's a reaction. If there's a point, a perspective, by definition, there's a view and vice versa. So, so that leads me to go a little bit off script and say, we'll yeah. ask you one other thing, which people may be wondering about. We talk about D, S, R, and P as the patterns that yeah. underlie thinking, but you've just talked about uh, identity, other part, whole point view and a action reaction. Can you just talk a little bit about the elements that underlie them and why they're important? Yeah, that's, that's a, a good question the, the elements are really the thing that matters, right? Because each one is a, is an interaction effect between two uh, kind of balanced I, I, uh, elements. And um so a lot of times when people are new to it, they they think distinction, systems, relationships, and perspectives. And as you get more aware of, of your cognition, you realize that the at the element level is where the real dynamicy is happening. Um, so distinctions are really definitionally just the interaction between an identity and another. Right. The systems are just the interaction between part and whole. Relationships are just interactions between relate, you know, action and reaction. Um, and perspective is the interaction between a point, a looker, and a view or a looked at. And based on your answer about bias, are you it seems like making a connection that maybe you're saying bias emerges from the inability to see both of those things or consider both of the elements inside of each pattern. So yes. for example, just one point. Yeah, if you if you effect. just look at the identity and you don't see the other, right. by definition, like if I say, you know, this this mason jar, right? I'm making a distinction. And I'm also making the distinction cognitively, not mason jar. Right. So you're going to hear, for example, later about economic markets. Well, what do we mean by markets and what do we not mean by markets? So the the definition of the way we define markets might be a bias in and of itself. Right. And so we have to test those boundaries because those boundaries are very germane to the everything downstream that we do, right? All those distinctions mm -hmm. are going to affect everything we do. And if we have bias in those distinctions, they will perturbate right. down throughout everything. And those distinctions, of course, are based on a perspective and based on the parts that we're seeing and not seeing and the relationships between the parts that we're seeing and not seeing. So these are very dynamic rules, much like the dynamicy that you're seeing in, in, um, in Ian's work that, you know, these, these little agents are interacting, mm -hmm. but there's millions of these interactions going on based on um, the complexity of the system. Interesting. Uh, well, so then that leads to the next question I'm seeing, which is, can you explain a little bit more on the idea that thinking is an emergent property of simple rules and that we can learn systems thinking through moves? Like, what are the relationships between the emergent property, the rules, and the moves? Just a little more detail. So again, yeah, if you if you just think about it as an an analogy, because thinking, you know, our, our thinking about our thinking is very uh, mis, mis somewhat misinformed, I guess I would say. Um, think about something like an MMA fight, a mixed martial arts fight, or a, a a jam session with music. Right, the actual jam session is incredibly organic. It's incredibly dynamic. You've got a bunch of players, a bunch of instruments. They're jamming. They're riffing. They're interaction. They have local interactions, right? Mm -hmm. And so this it's this very emergent property. And if you've got those same group of musicians together 10 minutes later and played the exact same song, it would be a completely different jam session, yes. right? Yes. So it's an emergent property 
of some simple rules that are playing out, right? Mm -hmm. So thinking is that way too. Yet most of our thinking models are these stepwise, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. Those are the, that's, those are the theories of thinking, mm -hmm. right? Well, that, those, don't, those are incompatible with each other. You're not going to get this organic outcome with these sort of stepwise, right. uh, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this in linear mm -hmm. order, yeah. formulaic. What, what we're actually doing is we're, we, there, are, there is simplicity to what we're doing. These, it's these simple rules. And we're just, we're just running an algorithm of those simple rules over and over and over again. And we're getting these very, very, very complex emergent property that we call thinking, right? And does that mean that we're like, you know, you build muscle memory when you're practicing moves in jujitsu, you're building like cognitive memory. Cognitive yeah, so the, exactly. That's right. You're, you're just, you're burning the neurons, right? You're, you're burning the neurons and the neurons are getting used to doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and so, you, but you're burning them not around informational types of things like the, the state capital of Texas, but more around structural things. Like right. if, if, uh, if something exists, what is it a part of? And what is that something a part of? And what is that something a part of? And what are the parts of that something? So it's a structural algorithm that's causing you to make structural predictions about things that could be thought that haven't been thought yet. Nice. Right? Yep. Okay, so we have time for one more question before yep. we go to our next speaker. Um, one uh, member of the audience wanted to know, is DSRP related to Kahneman's work? <laughs> thinking like, is it a system one or a system two type of thinking? How does it relate to his work? Yeah, so... Um, Kahneman's work. Uh, Kahneman's work is interesting, right? It, it's it's um, it it talks about system one and system two. System one is sort of fast, and it, the 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 upside is that it's fast. The downside is that it's uh, that it's um, wrong a lot, right? It's a pretty big downside. Pretty big downside. <laughs> Uh, system two thinking is is like more slow but more accurate. Th this kind of bias, I will I will go so far as to say bias, has been around for a really long time, like back into antiquity. Um, and and I think we know a lot more about for, in cognitive science and neuroscience about the the way the hemispheres in the brain work and things like that to sort of say that this is just kind of like a slightly more sophisticated version of this very old way of thinking there, I, you know, you can practice and burn the neurons and do organic dynamic things better by practice. Right. And so you can have fast and accurate thinking, which is what most people are looking for. Right. Especially if you're you know, an, an Olympic athlete or special forces or anybody that's in a, a fast moving, high stress environment, you, you, you need, you can't do fast and inaccurate or slow and right. You need fast and accurate as much as is humanly possible. Right. So how do you train for fast and accurate? Well, the, the special forces do it all the time. You know, they're going into massively complex, massively adaptive, chaotic environments and they're training for those environments, right? They're training for those environments. And that training is practice, practice, practice. And then they get into the environment and they're able to move quickly and accurately, meaning the, the results are relatively good um, based on that practice. So thinking is no different. If you want to be fast and accurate in some organic sit in situ environment, you've got to practice the moves just like you practice BJ, you know, BJJ moves, jujitsu moves, or whatever you practice, practice, practice. Then you get into a fight. Everything, all you know, your whole plan stops when you get punched in the face for the first time, and then you've got to adapt. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to utilize all that, all that neuron building, right? right? All that you're going to utilize all that practice. But part of that practice is built in adaptivity, right? Right. So. I think it was a patent or somebody that said like, you know, your plan is good or no, I think it was Mike Tyson that said, you know, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Right. Uh, and, and that, that is very true. That's what an organic dynamic situation is like. And that's what thinking 
is not this contemplative, uh, you know, like the thinker statue. Thinking is, is not this uh, reflective kind of thing. Thinking is actionable. Thinking is dynamic. We're doing it all the time. If, if, you know, Ian's presentation is a great example. Of the, there's all this thinking going on, right? All the time. It's very much a part of how they're navigating this uh, geospatial place, you know? And, um, and so thinking is very dynamic mm -hmm. and very all the time. It's not uh, navel gazing. No, you know, or just when we're being reflective, right, 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 and we can have agency over our thinking, purpose over our thinking is what you're saying. Yeah, there's a yeah, there is this beautiful um, aspect of our of our cognition, uh, metacognition, which is we can actually, by being more metacognitive, we can have agency over what we do cognitively. Right. So we can change the dynamicy of the rules. Yes. Yes. Um, that reminds me of the time we were at that elementary school yes. and we were talking to K through, and I won't take long, I promise, K through fourth graders. And we were talking to them about thinking and we asked them what thinking was. And they said, oh, it just happens just like our heartbeats. Yes. And we actually spent some time explaining that you can have some purpose and agency over how you're thinking once you know how you're thinking things through and, and that sort of stuff. But anyway, I don't want to get on the side. So thank you very much. Yeah.